AMD sent us this example of the Razorblade 14 2023 because it features their brand new Ryzen 9 7940HS processor. That might sound similar to the Ryzen 9 7945HX processor that I recently reviewed in an ASUS laptop. There are some similarities to both Zen 4 architecture, but there are also a significant number of differences. Razer is very excited about their new Blade 14. That's the eyes cross the T's, deep in the T's. And AMD is very excited about their new Ryzen 9 Phoenix processor. A word of warning, however, to our audience. This review contains references to AI. So grab a cup of tea and make sure you take your blood pressure medication. Before I dive deep into the Ryzen 9 7940HS, let's take an overview of the Razorblade 14. The starting at $2,400 price ticket obviously sounds enticing. However, this specific model in the UK, including taxes, you have to think in terms of £2,700. There are three versions of the Razorblade 14. The cheapest model has RTX 4060 graphics and 16 gigabytes of DDR500. Then you step up 300 US dollars to a model with RTX 4070 graphics and still 16 gigabytes of DDR5 Add another $100 in agate 32 gigabytes of DDR5 It's worth noting both the RTX 4060 and RTX 4070 graphics are capped at 140 watts and we didn't see the RTX 4070 graphics in this laptop drawing anything like 140 watts during benchmarking. As an extra point, both the SSD and memory are conventional components that can be upgraded by the owner. You can see why Razer describes this laptop as small in size and big in performance. There's a lot of very decent hardware inside a relatively small and compact chassis. Comparing the Razorblade 14 2023 with the 2022 version, we can see a number of points of similarity and a handful of changes. The new processor is Ryzen 9 7000 series rather than 6000, but we're still talking about eight cores and 16 threads, and the clock speeds haven't changed a great deal. And yes, it's the AI part of the CPU that is a significant change. Graphics naturally have stepped on from RTX 3000 series to 4000. The screen is a higher refresh rate, 240 hertz, and the QHD Plus descriptor tells us that this is actually a 2560 by 1600 rather than 2560 by 1440 panel. In other words, it's 1610 rather than 169. And that is the reason why the Kit Guru logo has been mangled. It's not difficult to change the resolution of the screen to the conventional 1440p, whereupon the display looks entirely normal. However, the native resolution of this panel is 2560 by 1600. It's an IPS panel and it's rated at 240 Hertz. Storage continues to be one terabyte of Gen 4 SSD. If you choose to upgrade, this laptop can accommodate up to four terabytes of SSD. Memory, as mentioned, this model has 16 gigabytes in dual channel. You can install up to 32 gigabytes. The speed of the memory has increased from DDR5-4800 last year to DDR5-5600 this year. The CPU graphics cooler is still a vapor chamber. You get RGB on the keyboard, just as you'd expect. It's interesting to note the 2023 version is 18 millimeters in thickness, although Razer says 17.99. Last year's model was 16.98, so we've gained a mil on thickness. We have a handful of ports on either side of the chassis, one USB-C, one USB-A, plus an HDMI 2.1 on the right-hand side. Specifically, those ports are USB 4 Type-C with Power Delivery 3, rated at 100 watts and DisplayPort 1.4. The USB-A's are USB 3.2 Gen 2 Type-A. The graphics output is HDMI 2.1. You also have Kensington Lock. And you have a combo headset jack. The port that looks at first glance as though it might be a large USB-C is actually the power connector for this 230 watt power adapter. The port is back here, so we can plug the connector like so. But if we get forgetful and plug it going forwards, 
we cover those ports and connectors on that side, which is not ideal. The weight of the laptop, 1.84 kilos. This power adapter plus a regular mains cable adds another 750 grams. So we're around about the two and a half kilo mark all in. As mentioned, the add-in graphics are either GeForce RTX 4060 or RTX 4070. You can only imagine the trauma it caused AMD to send us a sample of a laptop that uses Nvidia on top of AMD rather than AMD on AMD. Power rating up to 140 watts. As I mentioned, I didn't see a figure anything close to 140, therefore that does not seem to be any form of limitation. And you can see from those dimensions, this is indeed a compact laptop. And then we move on to the processor, the AMD Ryzen 9 7940HS in the new Razorblade 14 is a member of AMD's Phoenix range of processors. The Ryzen 9 7945HX that I recently reviewed, despite having a similar name to the 7940HS, is actually quite different. You can even tell this by eye. Dragon Range clearly has an IO Dian 2 chiplets, just like the desktop models, so it's not a great stretch for imagination to suggest it is a desktop processor that's been repurposed for mobile form with up to 16 cores. By contrast, the HS series of Phoenix processors on monolithic dies. They look completely different. They even use a different fabrication process, which is called TSMC N4P. However, despite its name, it's not actually four nanometer. It's an updated version of the same five nanometer process. Clearly, there is scope for confusion. And this caused Luke to get somewhat grumpy at CES earlier this year. They've done a bunch of interesting stuff at CES 2023. So they've announced the new processors for the laptops, or the APUs, I should say, Zen 4. Let's go and have a look at some laptops, shall we? What we've learned in the briefing is about AMD's Ryzen 7000. So one of the new points that I want to bring up is the 7045 series. And this is new. So it's following the chiplet design that we see with the desktop AMD processors. And that's a complete differentiation to the monolithic design that we see on the 7040 series processors, which are more of an evolution of the 6000 series laptop or mobile processors. There are going to be some differences, though. So you're going to have to pay real attention to that product stack. For example, the AI-based features through the XDNA engine. You're not going to get those with 7045. The product stack, if I'm being perfectly honest, looks like a complete and utter mess. There's a mix of 4 nanometer, I think 5 nanometer, 6 nanometer, 7 nanometer, Zen 2, Zen 3, Zen 3 plus, Zen 4, RDNA 2, RDNA 3, XDNA, not XDNA, USB 4, USB 4 asterisk, not USB 4. Um, have I missed anything else out? Uh, probably milkshake and coffee. I, I don't know, I just, this is the shop in this. I'll throw the kitchen sink at it. As you can see, the specification of this Ryzen 9 7940HS, eight cores, 16 threads, maximum boost is 5.2 gigahertz, 24 megabytes of cache, and a TDP in the range of 35 to 54 watts. Those power settings are significant, and to my mind, that's the reason why AMD sent us a Razer Blade as a review sample. If you delve around within Windows 11, you find a mere two power settings, and they are really quite basic, essentially balanced, and performance, and they don't tell you anything about what the system is doing. By contrast, if you dive into Razer's Synapse software, you have a whole heap of settings. In Synapse, if you set the CPU and the GPU both to low, the GPU will run on 75 watts, which takes it under two gigahertz, while the CPU has 37 watts and runs at 3.8 gigahertz all cores. Increase Synapse to medium for both CPU and GPU. The GPU now has 85 watts and will run at 2.15 gigahertz while the CPU has 42 watts and runs at 4 gigahertz. With both the GPU and the CPU on high in Synapse, the GPU will pull 100 watts and clock at 2.28 gigahertz, while the CPU will pull 45 watts and run at 4 gigahertz. Go all the way with the GPU on high and the CPU on boost, so the GPU now has 100 watts, still runs at 2.28 gigahertz, the CPU will push to 50 watts 
and 4.2 GHz. In CPU only tasks where the graphics aren't loading the cooling system, the CPU can run at 4.5 GHz on all cores, pulling 66 watts. In other words, it's not enough to tell you what the CPU and the GPU are in this laptop. You have to actually see them in action. You also have to hear them in action. As we change the settings in Synapse, the fan speeds will adjust to suit the needs of the vapor chamber cooler. And when we push the limits up to boost, the fans will slowly ramp up to full speed. And that can get rather noisy. The point here is that it's not just about the settings for the laptop, it's also about the usability. At one end of the scale, it performs perfectly well and is lovely and quiet. At the other end of the scale, it performs somewhat better and is just as noisy as heck. You've seen Cinebench R23 running there in a number of different configurations, so let's put some figures on performance. With the processor running at 42 watts and 4.0 gigahertz all cores, we get a score of 14,922, which is perfectly decent. Bumping up the performance to 48 watts and 4.2 gigahertz all cores, the score rises to 15,611, which is clearly better. And we can see those two scores bracket the Intel Core i9-12900HK running at 72 watts. In other words, the AMD is delivering very similar performance at significantly lower power levels. In Cinebench R23 single core, the Ryzen 9 is pulling 23 watts and running at 5.2 gigahertz. We can see here that this is very similar performance to the Intel Core i7-12800H, which requires 43 watts to deliver that same level of performance. So AMD wins on the efficiency front. So what about those references to AI? This is clearly a significant technology in this new processor and AMD is going large on the subject. Just look, this processor delivers your own personal AI processing hardware. You might at this stage either be thrilled or possibly mildly terrified. Specifically, it's the XDNA engine inside this processor family which delivers the benefits of AI. And we can see from this diagram that the layout is similar to a graphics chip. The point AMD is making is that a dedicated AI engine, they call it XDNA, is better than a traditional regular processor hammering away at a job. But this comes as no surprise. Dedicated accelerators ought to do a better job than a general purpose compute unit. And we see here that AMD is talking about their developer support roadmap. In other words, at launch, you get some stuff. However, by the end of the year, there'll be more stuff. Moving on to the next slide, if you look in the center, you will see it says Microsoft Windows now has features that require a dedicated AI engine. So we're talking about Windows 11 rather than an upcoming Windows 12 or whatever they're gonna call the next version of the OS. And look to the left, the only on-chip dedicated AI engine in Windows x86 notebooks. Well, that's a bold claim. AMD is ahead of the field and they have something that no one else can provide in a notebook. The glue that holds this all together is Microsoft Direct ML. And as you can see, this is supported by AMD, Intel, and Nvidia, i.e. the big three in the world of Windows. Direct ML, as we understand it, is similar to DirectX, i.e. it's an API that is for machine learning. The thing is that we had a briefing from Intel a little while ago about Meteor Lake, which is due later this year, and they were talking about very similar features to AMD with their machine learning AI engine. Where AMD refers to their AI engine as XDNA, Intel refers to a VPU, but the two technologies appear to be fairly similar. Intel is promising features that relate to your webcam. So for example, you can have a basic background blur or an advanced background blur. And looky here in the AMD slides, we see the promise of very similar features. Automatic framing to keep you centered in your video chat, eye contact so it looks as though you're looking at the camera when in fact you're looking at your screen and background effects or blurring. 
And let's see what all that means in practice, shall we? So I have the camera turned on, as you can see, and looky here, those three clever smart AI settings are all disabled by default. Let's turn them on. Automatic framing. Eye contact and background blur. Well, the background blur certainly works. I'm going to look down, bottom right, and back. And you can draw your own conclusion. And I'm now going to look completely. In fact, I'm going to look up at this camera here, which is above the webcam and back to the webcam. And the background blur looks absolutely fine. Let's go for portrait blur rather than standard blur. So there we have it. The very first wave of AI features is here. And let's face it, you've seen background blur before. So it is safe to say that these dedicated AI features with this dedicated AI hardware engine in this processor, it's a very tentative toe in the water. Undeniably, AI is coming to laptops, whether you like it or not, but the features that we have in 2023 are relatively trivial. Let's take a look at the performance of the new Razorblade 14. It's time for our performance charts. As previously mentioned, Cinebench R23 multi-core, the laptop does perfectly well. This eight core processor has decent performance. Single core performance, also good. And given the low power draw, we can also applaud its efficiency. Blender 3.1 Classroom. This is a very similar test to Cinebench R23. It's a pure CPU test. And we can see here that the new Ryzen 9 does very nicely. Clearly this is a combination of core count and core speed. Eight cores operating at four gigahertz does well. CPU power consumption. Clearly this depends on the settings that you choose. 48 watts is actually towards the higher end of the envelope for this particular processor you can easily turn it down to 42 or 40 watts. Bapco Crossmark. It's an all system test rather than CPU or graphics. And in this test, the new Razorblade 14 does perfectly okay. In 7-zip version 22 benchmark, the new Ryzen 9 7940HS is doing well. The thing to note here is the processor is running on 48 watts. The CPUs above it are pulling significantly more power and the CPUs below it also pulling more power. You have to go quite a long way down the chart, fun enough to the Razorblade 15 with Intel Core i7-12800H to find a processor on comparable power draw. And that notebook and processor combo are performing significantly worse than the new Razorblade 14. Ada 64 memory bandwidth. So we're on fast DDR5 memory here. It is really curious to me that the write speed is better than the read speed. Double check these figures, it's correct. I honestly don't understand this one, but the new Razorblade 14 memory bandwidth test, really good. 3D Mark CPU profile, the Ryzen 9 7940HS does well. In the CPU element of 3D Mark Time Spy, the new Razorblade 14 is towards the bottom of the chart. 3D Mark Time Spy overall score, so clearly here we're combining both CPU and GPU. And the Razorblade 14 is plumb in the middle of the chart. Then we move on to gaming. So Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy. We're running at 1080p and very high image quality preset. It comes as no surprise at the top of the chart we have the Asus ROG Strix Scar 17 which has 16 core Ryzen 9 and RTX 4090. I was somewhat surprised the Razorblade 15 is in second place with a Core i7 and RTX 3080 Ti. That combo putting the RTX 4070 firmly in its place. Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy. This is nominally at 1440p. However, the Razorblade 14 is running at 2560 by 1600 because the game settings don't allow you to run this particular laptop at 1440 without rejigging the display resolution. Frame rates, perfectly decent. Far Cry 6 at 1080. 
Again, we have some shenanigans with the resolution. So both this laptop and also the Lenovo Legion 5i Pro 16 actually running at 1920 by 1200. The Lenovo is at the bottom of the chart by a significant margin. While the Razer Wave 14 comes next to bottom, it is actually entirely playable. We're talking here 101 or 103 FPS on average, and then a 1% low of 72 or 73. So no problems with those scores. Far Cry 6 at 1440. Again, we're operating at 2560 by 1600. We're in the 80 something frames on average, and the lows are 60 something frames. So those scores perfectly acceptable. Watch Dogs Legion at 1080, Razor Blade 14 in the middle of the chart. We're close to 90 FPS on average and we're around the 60 FPS 1% low. Watch Dogs Legion at 1440, again 2560 by 1600, 60 FPS on average, 40 FPS 1% low. So perhaps here we're overstepping our luck. And finally, the battery score. PC Mark 10 battery test. The new Razer Blade 14, really impressive battery score. And it's not a very large battery. The hardware inside this laptop operates really well and is highly efficient. And so we come to the conclusion of my review. A few points that occur to me. I love the screen of the Razer Blade 14. Also, I've adjusted the resolution for this conclusion so the KitGuru logo is displayed correctly. The keyboard is perfectly okay. The per key RGB lighting is exactly what we expect from Razer. The touchpad is enormous and lovely. This little plastic flip cover that goes over the webcam is nasty. It functions, but it's just bleh. And it's certainly not what I expect on a laptop of this uh, price and quality. Overall, I like the laptop. It's an eight and a half out of 10 and are worth buying. However, as you'll see when I come to my uh, individual points, my pros and my cons, the RTX 4070 graphics in this laptop to my mind are overkill. They're rated up to 140 watts and yet I never saw them pulling past 110. So to my mind, RTX 4060 running at the same 110 watts, I think would have a very similar level of performance to the RTX 4070. Therefore, I think you could go down one skew in the product stack, perhaps bump up your memory or your SSD. And I suspect uh, in everyday use, you'd have a laptop that was, if anything, better than this laptop and possibly slightly cheaper. The pros and the cons. Pros, the good points. Excellent battery life, really impressive. The CPU is punchy, yet efficient. Eight cores, what's not to like? Four gigahertz plus, oh yes. The vapor chamber cooler allows the laptop to operate nice and quietly, or if you ramp up the fans to boost mode, fairly noisily. The vapor chamber cooler itself, however, that works well. The memory and SSD can be upgraded. Removing the bottom cover, it's a handful of tiny screws, and then you have access to the battery, the Wi-Fi card, memory, and SSD. So getting inside and changing components, easy. Cons, the negative points. The RTX 4070 graphics seem like overkill. As I've already mentioned, I suspect RTX 4060 would be absolutely fine. In a similar vein, you only get eight gigabytes of graphics memory. Eight gigabytes strikes me as an absolute minimum. I think we'd all like to see more, even in laptops. It's not just desktops that need plenty of graphics memory. 10 gigabytes, probably not enough. Let's push on, let's go past 12. 16 gigabytes, please. That I think would suit us nicely. The third con, the advantages of AI are still unclear. Making your webcam work better, that's nice, but it's crystal clear that the manufacturers have got other things in mind for AI. Quite what those other things are, don't yet know, and don't yet know whether I like them or not. And finally, the 16-10 aspect ratio of the screen confuses the settings in some games. If you like a 16-10 screen, great. Personally, I'm more than happy with 16-9. It's more conventional and it works with everything. You can, of course, change the resolution of the screen in the display settings, but I prefer not to have to mess around with that kind of thing. Overall, the laptop itself, as I've already mentioned, I like it. It's a worth buying. It's an eight and a half out of 10. The processor only seems like an incremental improvement over the 6,000 generation of processors from AMD, but it's good. And after all, you don't buy a processor for a laptop, you buy a laptop. I'm happy. This is worth buying.